This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight, we apply our patent-pending Stanley rubric to the second movie in our Season 3 March Trilogy Month, Ocean's 12, from 2004, directed by Steven Soderbergh, written by George Nolfi, starring George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, Julia Roberts, and Catherine Zeta-Jones. However, quickly before we get to the show, next week we will be covering the final movie of the Ocean's Trilogy, Ocean's 13, directed by Steven Soderbergh, written by Brian Koppelman and David Levine, Love those guys. Starring George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, Andy Garcia, and Al Pacino. hoo You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. And, as always, please like, follow, rate, and review the show on whichever podcast platform you use. We would really appreciate it. All right, Dad, I'm not really sure how to start the conversation on this sequel, but is the title misleading? Well, to some extent, because I, depending on how you count it, I mean, if you add Julia Roberts, yes, it's 12, but then what about Catherine Zeta-Jones? So then it would be 14. You mean 13? Excuse me. It would be 12, then it would be 13. Yes, if you included them as part of the gang, collectively. I don't know. I assumed when they announced 12, that they'd at least add one general, like, heist cast member to the the group. And that just never seemed to be the case. When you first came and told me that they were making a sequel and it was going to be Ocean's 12, I'm like, oh, okay, who are they getting to add in? And then it was Catherine Zeta-Jones. But she was never part of the heist. No. So Julia Roberts technically was because she was pretending to be herself in the ultimate in breaking down the... fourth wall oh the absolute meta verse of julia roberts playing Tess, playing julia roberts talking to julia roberts yes Mm -hmm. such a weird scene for me and i know some people find it hilarious i do not it takes me out of the movie almost every single time but we'll get to that so my second question is should this movie have been set in europe Well, they were trying to differentiate it and create something different and unique from the first. And quite frankly, I think it was about the same time that George Clooney bought his house on Lake Como in Italy anyway. So my guess is, is he said, I'll do the next one, but we're going to do it where my house is. Kind of. I mean, part of this movie is not really in, well, excuse me, the majority of this movie is not in Lake Como. I mean, they have a couple of scenes there, but it's at somebody else's house. And yes, I guess the latter part of the movie is technically in Italy, but there's significant scenes in Amsterdam and Los Angeles and some other places. This actually has the most disparate locations of the three movies. I think they filmed in like 10 different places. Well, I I know they were trying to give it a different look. Well, they certainly accomplished that, but unfortunately there's just something about the Las Vegas nightlife and how they film the other two movies that just make it seem different. I think this movie could have very easily been in New York, Miami, New Orleans, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle for that matter, and still worked as far as how the cast and crew kind of went about things. I think you can place good con men movies there, but placing it in Rome on during the middle of the day for the majority of the movie just never seemed to fit what I think of when I think of this franchise. It's probably why it's considered the lesser of the three. Well, I'll get into another reason that I discovered in my research as to why I think this might be a lesser of the three films. But, all right, what is your relationship to this movie? I never saw it until uh, much later. I think I saw it for the first time about five or six years ago. Didn't get to the theater when it uh, was released. And... Those people that went and saw it said, eh, it wasn't that good. So I just kind of deadpanned and said, you know, I don't care. So I won't go. So I didn't see it at the theaters, didn't see it was released, and 
only saw it much later. And I think that this time watching it for the show itself was only the third or fourth time I watched it. But I must say, each time I've watched it, I've had a better appreciation of it. So I remember watching this probably about 2006, somewhere in there, and I didn't think much of it. I think it's grown on me a little bit. I think there are moments within this movie that work. I don't think the totality of it does for me. And again, some stuff that we'll get to throughout the course of this episode. But realistically, I I think there's something just missing. It's like intangible qualities that I think are present in the other two films. Maybe it's in a writing. Maybe it's in a setting. uh, Maybe it's how all of the characters are interacting. But it just... I don't know if it's like a crowdedness the certain or certain right people are not on screen enough for me or how it all works out, but it just, there's something not quite oceans for me that the other two seem to portray. That being said, I do remember watching this just briefly before the last and film that you and I uh, will get to next week, but we saw that one in theaters and the fact that you had seen that one, I would say probably half a dozen times before ever watching 12. I remember the first time that I made you watch this. We did like a marathon over a weekend where there was nothing else on. It was like that dead period in the middle of the summer. And I'm like, oh, all three movies are on Hulu or whatever it was. And we sat and we watched all three because you have no problem sitting through the other two. But you just had never bothered to sit down and watch 12. And so I finally just made you do it. Yeah. And I think that's actually happened on a couple of different occasions with different franchises. But all right, so let's get into the heart of the movie and the background here. Do you have a plot summary ready for us? I do. Terry Benedict, Andy Garcia, locates all 11 members of Danny Ocean's George Clooney's crew, demanding that they return the $160 million they stole from his casinos plus $38 million in interest. Short by half, the group schemes to stage another heist in Amsterdam to avoid problems with U.S. authorities and pay back Benedict. However, their plans are upended by the Night Fox, Vincent Cassell, another master thief who has set up Ocean's Eleven as a game to prove he is the best thief in the world. Meanwhile, Rusty Ryan's Brad Pitt, ex-girlfriend, Isabel Lahiri, Catherine Zeta-Jones, is circling around the group trying to catch them before they can find their way out of trouble. Thank you. Cast for this movie, and this might be one of the longest cast lists I will ever read on this show. Steven Soderbergh as director, George Nolfi as writer, George Clooney as Danny Ocean, Brad Pitt as Robert Rusty Ryan, Matt Damon as Linus Caldwell, Bernie Mac as Frank Catton, Elliot Gould as Ruben Tishkoff, Casey Affleck as Virgil Malloy, Scott Kahn as Turk Malloy, Eddie Jameson as Livingston Dell, Don Cheadle as Basher Tarr, Shabo Kin as The Amazing Yen, Carl Reiner as Saul Bloom, Julia Roberts as Tess Ocean, Catherine Zeta-Jones as Isabel Lahiri, Andy Garcia as Terry Benedict, Vincent Cassell as Baron Francois Tallure, The Night Fox, Albert Finney as Gaspar Lamarck, who is also uncredited, Eddie Izzard as Roman Nagel, Bruce Willis as himself, also uncredited, Cherry Jones as Molly Starr slash Mrs. Caldwell, Robbie Coltrane as Matt Suey, and Topher Grace as himself. Recognition for this film. The film was released in the United States on December 10th, 2004, and received generally mixed reviews from critics. It was a financial success, grossing $362 million worldwide and becoming the 10th highest grossing film of 2004. Did you know? The story of this film was taken from Honor Among Thieves, a screenplay treatment written by George Nolfi that was originally intended to be a John Woo vehicle. Ugh. When it was decided that Ocean's <laughs> Eleven was going to have a sequel, Warner Brothers asked Nolfi to write the script, adjusting it for the Ocean's Eleven characters. Did you know? The Night Fox's mansion is on the shores of Lake Como in Italy. The name of the city overlooking Lake Como is Bellagio. The city and the lake were the inspiration for the design of the Bellagio Casino in Las Vegas. Site of the heist in Ocean's Eleven. Did you know? Vincent Cassell did not need a stuntman for the laser dance. He is an expert in copiera, I hope I pronounced that right, a Brazilian dance-like martial art, and performed the entire dance himself. The lasers, however, were added in post. A lot of things you can do in editing. Did you know? The museum intended to be robbed 
has the name Galleria de Art di Roma on the outside, but the building is not actually one of the countless museums in Rome, although some exhibits are held there, but rather the British school at Rome located in the lands of Via Borghese. Did you know? Peter Fonda filmed a cameo as Bobby Caldwell, Linus's father, but it did not make the final cut. A different actor actually plays him in Ocean's 13, but tune in next week for that. Did you know? Brad Pitt called Matt Damon to convince him to do the movie. Damon was going to back out of the movie, since his character didn't have a prime role. Plus, he was coming out of filming the Bourne movie. The script was rewritten for Damon. This led to Linus asking Rusty to take on a bigger part of the next con in the airplane. Mark Wahlberg was considered to play Linus if Damon had passed. Thank you very, very much, Matt Damon. I don't know what this would have been with Mark Wahlberg in it, but I'm so (laughs) glad that you did this. Did you know? Benedict says repeatedly that he wants Ocean's Eleven to pay back what they stole, $160 million plus interest. It is never stated definitively how much the interest is, but the final check Benedict gets to satisfy the debt is for $198 million, meaning he charged about 24% interest. Given that insurance had already repaid his money, getting robbed was extremely profitable for him. Did you know? Before filming began, Brad Pitt put out a memo to all crew members stating that they only addressed George Clooney as his character's name, Danny Ocean, or Mr. Ocean. Eventually, Clooney found out about this and got back at Pitt by putting bumper stickers on the back of his car that read either, I'm gay and I vote, or small penis on board. (laughs) And with that, we'll take a quick break and we will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. Dad, what would you say to pitch this movie to a friend? Game of cat and mouse in Europe trying to ultimately steal the grand prize. A rival thief to Ocean's Eleven conducts some cunning cat and mouse to ultimately face off against one another to prove who is the best thieves in the world. I guess, who are the best thieves in the world? Ultimately, neither are because it's uh, basically the pharmaceutical companies. I don't know. I could say just corporations generally. Yeah. Either way. Best performance for you? Uh, Brad Pitt. He had a bigger role in this film. I thought he did a very good job overall. I think he carried the film much more. And uh, I liked his character and I liked the interplay with Catherine Zeta-Jones. You know, I would agree that he obviously had a bigger part in this movie, but... I don't know. I I felt he was actually better off in the role he played in the first movie, where he seemed kind of aloof and above it all. I think when he kind of played the ringleader for the majority of the movie, I thought he had a little bit more air of confidence. This one, he only really shows that card that he has, that kind of nonchalant, uh, I'm Brad Pitt and I know I'm really, really handsome card is really at the end after he basically engineers the whole thing and gets Isabel to meet her father. Spoiler alert for a movie that's almost 20 years old. But I don't know. I I just didn't buy his kind of back and forth making mistakes type of Rusty. It didn't seem to play as well with the character. And I just didn't buy it as much as I do with the other two where he seemed a more set and confident character. And I think that's probably a better version of it to me. One of the characters, though, that I think actually is alluring in this film, I think a lot of them, unfortunately, were kind of underdeveloped and underwritten in this one as opposed to the other two movies. But I actually thought this was a fairly well-developed and well-played villain. So I went with Vincent Cassell to lure as my best performance. I think he creates kind of a memorable villain, and it's one of the few things that sticks out from this movie, especially when he pops up in 13 that you're like, oh yeah, that guy. And at least he's kind of got this tie into the rest of the franchise from this point going forward. I really would have liked to see how they would have included him in maybe another sequel past that in like a 14 or a 15 if they had ever gotten to that point. Regardless, I do think he's a wonderful foil with all of the backflips and laser dances and uh, the Onyx figurines. They just create such a rich character to use as the eventual foil for all of this, this French aristocrat who's this cat burglar. Except I think it seems a little out of place in this movie, and that clearly that particular character was developed for 
a completely different movie that was kind of retconned to fit the Oceans franchise, as we said at the at the top in the Did You Know section. So I went with Vincent Cassell. I think he's affable. I think he's charismatic. I like the character, even though he's the bad guy in this one. Best secondary performance for me, I went with Catherine Zeta-Jones. Again, I think this is kind of like the secondary lead in this movie. She gets a lot to do for being just the one who's kind of chasing them. And I think more than anything else, she's kind of the magic trick of this whole thing. You think that she's always going to be in control, that even though she's manipulating the forms in order to try and catch these guys, and she has this like almost personal vendetta to try and catch them before they uh, eventually rob the museum, that it all ends up blowing up in her face. And realistically, she was never going to catch them in the first place. They were always playing around with her, and this was all part of their plan. So I think she's kind of the distraction for what's actually going on, even though I don't think that that part of the movie really works. But I thought she was endearing to what she had to do as kind of stepping into this franchise and being a completely new character that was not part of the first one and that you had to almost build this connection with her from scratch, even from the first scene where she and Brad Pitt technically break up. So I think that with all of the backstory, because you really have to care by the end of this that Lamarck is going to meet his daughter in order for this movie to have any working factor on anyone. I don't, that's not well phrased, but that's what I'm going with. Uh, I think that she deserves at least some credit for best secondary performance from me. Who was your I best secondary? As well. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes, I did her as well. And I must say, she was distracting. She distracted me through most of the film. Oh, God, Dad. <laughs> uh, she's actually better looking in real life. Anyway, she she just had a certain quality that she she you 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 believed that she was right there and ready to pounce, and somehow you just kind of had a feeling that they were going to somehow get around her that they're basically using her to advance their interests, but you're not sure. And she just kept being very tenacious and, and going through the efforts and doing what she needed to in her job and, and at times seeming like she was outsmarting them. Um, I just thought she did a very good job for those reasons. Most charismatic award. I went with Matt Damon. I think this really plants some of the seeds for what I think is one of his best comedic roles in Ocean's 13, but he really has no problem being kind of the fall guy for a lot of the pranks and such in these movies. Even though he starts off well in Ocean's 11 and he seems kind of like a really good thief and pickpocket, he's really cut down to size and becomes kind of the butt of a lot of the jokes even in 11. But this one where they really start to lean into the Linus is not necessarily the most reassuring guy. He's kind of the kid of the group. Uh, We're going to really kind of play with him. The whole Matsui scene is one of my favorites and the lost in (laughs) translation aspect of it. We'll get to that here in a second for best scene. But I really think that if there's one particular character that was more humorous than anything else, and I know they wrote in a couple of lines that were humorous and here and there, and Soderbergh has a good job or usually does a good job of putting some of those moments in there for some levity among the rest of it. He kind of makes these dramedies. But for me, Matt Damon probably takes the cake. It's why he's always been one of my favorites is that he has such a range as far as his character, and he's not afraid to make fun of himself. So for me, that's my most charismatic. Who'd you go with? Uh, George Clooney. Just the fact that at the more towards the end when the reveal takes place and he's there with Julia Roberts, he just looks so good, and he's so smooth, and nothing ruffles him. And it's just, I mean, to be that cool. I honestly think at this point in time, he's probably the coolest man in the world since Sean Connery is dead. Ooh, I don't know about that. Mm, okay. I know there will be people who argue, and it's not because of his looks or his... No, I, I don't think it's, a, it's going to be because of his politics, but I don't even think it's that. I just don't think universally that you can point to any one person and say that that's the coolest. I think there's a much broader discussion to be had. So best scene then 
this one wasn't like a huge list of scenes. There are some that work for me, and I kind of placed in a couple of others just to kind of get the full breadth of the film. But Benedict visits Ocean's Eleven, the montage kind of at the opening where he catches all of them in those different settings. I really like the montage scenes in the course of these movies, and Soderbergh does them so well. And the transitioning and the editing between all of them, the setup, and then kind of having him make that grand entrance and catching them all, I just thought that really worked for me. Uh, How much do we owe, basically, the first time that they all get back together? Meeting Matsui, I already pointed to that one. We can talk about that here in a second. The Amsterdam heist replay, because they don't actually show the heist as it's happening. It's kind of in when they're doing the forensic after the fact. Who is the Night Fox when we first meet Talur? Tess looks like Julia Roberts, the meta scene that we've talked about. FBI agent Star, and you talked to Lamarck. Did I leave any out? No, I think that covers the majority or the primary scenes. Okay, so any you want to talk about in particular? This is not a film where there were a lot of scenes that you go, that was a really good scene or a great scene. There were some that were okay, kind of good. Um, It's more collective for the film than an actual division where you can look at particular scenes and go, this the this scene advances or this scene is significant. So it was hard for me to really even come up with, you know, what my favorite scene was and then what the most indelible was. But I guess from my my favorite scene was the reveal. And I indicated when Clooney, uh, Roberts, and uh, Casella are on the patio and uh, on Lake Como and he discloses how he basically stole the Fabergé egg before Tulor ever had a chance to even get at it. I thought that was a pretty uh, decent scene. I guess that's my favorite just because everybody looked so good and it was so... When you look back on it and you see that where things are, again, they always put the clues, they hide the clues in plain sight. And those reveals are always so fun for me just to figure out where or how they did it and what the clues were that you missed in the course of the movie. It isn't even that they put them in plain sight. It's that they point to them more specifically, like they zoom in on the bag that's holding the Fabergé egg. They don't tell you why that's important, but it comes back later and you're like, oh yeah, okay, now I get it. It's the same thing with the pine tree in the first one. There's a reason that that comes back around. They do it with the hotel room number in 13. Soderbergh just does that very clearly. He tells you that this is going to be important, but you have no idea why, and it fills in later a blank, and you're like making the connections in your head, and that's why it feels cool. But I don't know. For me, that scene always undercuts the rest of the film because it's like, why did we go through the rest of this song and dance? It's not even something that was cool. You were just kind of playing with this guy that he really was never going to have an opportunity because they stole the egg before they ever met with him. So I I don't know. It it kind of undercuts the majority of the plot of the film because it just seems like, why did we go through all of this if it was just fake the whole time? Regardless, you said the reveal, but technically there are three different reveals during the course of this movie. There's the one where it looks like they're all going to be hauled away by the FBI, but it's really Linus's mom, and so they're not going to jail, and they all get to escape, and they're out of trouble. There's the one where you described it, and that's kind of the, how did the Fabergé egg get stolen? Okay. And then finally, Lamarck. Who is Lamarck, and what is his relationship to everybody else? Basically, why did he help them out? And it's because Isabella is his daughter. So there's really three, but I don't really think any of them really worked for me all that much. I think they were okay, but uh, probably if any of them, it's probably Cherry Jones being the mother of Linus that was like, oh, yeah. So anyway, for me, though, my favorite scene, and I mentioned it the other day while we were watching it, and it's because I knew it was coming. I kind of get a kick out of it every time because they're just playing around with Linus, but it's meeting Matsui. The Lost in Translation (laughs) thing, and he starts quoting Cashmere from Led Zeppelin, and you just called his daughter or his niece a whore. She's seven. She has... Oh, don't tell him that. Oh, it's so classic. It's probably the funniest scene in this movie. It is absolutely my favorite. But for me, most indelible, oddly enough, is the beginning of this movie. 
you're trying to pick up where you left off, and I thought it was a very clean cut ending, and bring all of these guys back together, but you have to have a way to do it. Now, them getting caught in Benedict coming after them isn't necessarily novel by itself, but trying to explain all of it, that he's coming to each one of them individually, the montage, and I already said Soderbergh is great at all of these montages. For me, kind of where they pick up and that they're on the run, and then he comes to confront all of them individually, and you kind of see them in their lives and what they've done with the money since they left the last movie. I thought it was actually a genius way of writing it in to pick up right where we left off almost and kind of give us an in into what their other lives are like. So did you already say that was your most indelible then? No, I went with the meta scene because okay. I don't know. I don't know how else. Whenever I think of that film, I think of that scene because I think most it's people just, do. It's so bizarre. I think most people think that when they think of this movie and I think, again, most people think it's hilarious. It takes me out of the movie every time. Well, and even in the credits, the last credit for the film for the actors is Tess as Julia Roberts. I don't know. It, it's such a bizarre moment. And then the whole Bruce Willis of it all and talking about the sixth sense, which I'll, I'll get into in classicness, but such a such a weird scene to be remembered for this movie. I, I don't quite understand it seems like something that they just kind of like, oh, this will be funny. And to me, it's really not. So anyway, let's take another quick break and we will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. All right. Before we get any further, Dad, do we have anyone to remember this week? We do. Uh, Three fairly, well, at least two fairly prominent and one uh, longtime actor. Uh, first off, Alan Ladd uh, Jr., uh, American film producer, former head of 20th Century Fox, Oscar winner in 1996. Uh, his career started out, he's the son of Alan Ladd, the uh, Hollywood star. He uh, started out working in, with 20th Century Fox in, uh, in Britain, had uh, met and talked to George Lucas, had... Uh, gone to Hollywood to, to uh, advocate or to be an advocate for Star Wars and the production of Star Wars. While he was there doing it, he suddenly became head of 20th Century Fox, so he then turned around and greenlighted Star Wars. Uh, without Alan Ladd Jr., there's a possibility that Star Wars was never made. He produced Outland in 1981. He uh, did Night Shift, which was uh, 1982. That was a Ron Howard film with um, Michael Keaton and uh, Henry F- um, Winkler. And uh, Police Academy, uh, he did, or his production company did Chariots of Fire, The Right Stuff, and Gone Baby Gone. His company also produced the original Blade Runner in 1982. Uh, Ned Eisenberg, uh, actor, did a lot of television and such, uh, was in Law & Order Special Victims Unit, uh, Limitless, played in uh, Flags of Our Fathers, longtime character actor in uh, television and films. Never really uh, major parts, but uh, somebody who carried, you know, significant weight in several different vehicles. And then Sally Kellerman, uh, American actress, in the movie MASH. She was the original Hot Lips Hulane. Sometime after that, she was in Back to School, the love interest of uh, Rodney Dangerfield, filmed in Madison, of all places, on uh, the University of Wisconsin campus. And then Brewster McCloud was another film. The last uh, 20, 30 years, she had primarily been uh, on stage and had done a lot of stage acting, uh, but still a very significant actress and very prominent in the 70s with multiple vehicles, MASH being the most noted. Well, obviously, she won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for the, her role in MASH. Uh, that's correct. So between when you and I discussed what time to record tonight and now, we actually had a fourth person that passed away that I'd like to mention here. Farrah Fork, uh, she was only 54, American actress and voice actress. She was on the show Wings from seasons four to six as one of the love interests. I think it was uh, an Alex a helicopter yes. pilot. Uh, yes. Lois and Clark, Party of Five, Disclosure, Heat. And she also did voiceovers for Batman Beyond and Justice League Unlimited. 
She unfortunately passed away uh, today. So obviously, I think Alan Ladd has had a significant impact on my movie watching career. I mean, just being the guy who eventually believed in Star Wars alone has produced untoward dividends that uh, I can't imagine. But Police Academy was, what, five films? Something like that? 26 years. I I know we're eventually going to get to Chariots of Fire. Oh, goodness. Uh, And uh, I do like Blade Runner. It's not one of my favorites, but I can appreciate that one. I mean, by most people's standards, it's one of the greatest films of all time. So... He's obviously been a, a major contributor. We had an Oscar winner, a longtime character actor, and a longtime character and voice actress. So uh, I, I we, would point out, too, that if we were to do a, a show, and maybe we should, our own lists of the top five or ten underrated films, the right stuff from 1983 would be on that list for me. I think it'll probably be longer than five. We could probably go to ten and maybe some honorable mentions. But films that maybe we think are better than people give it credit for. I don't know. I, it would depend on what the definition of that is. Either way, I know that's been a film of yours that you've loved forever. I've still not seen it, but I'm sure eventually we will get to it on the show. Either way, all four of these people, significant contributions to movie going and audiences everywhere. We remember them here with a moment of silence in their honor. Thank you. All right, let's move to best lines, funniest lines. I only have two nominees because otherwise it's like large conversations that you need a lot of context for. I mean, I could have put the whole Matt Suey scene because I think that's great. But then why do I need to point to that as a scene? I'll just, I don't know. It's not a line. It's a conversation. I only have really two of them on here. First one I had, Rusty Ryan. It's not in my nature to be mysterious, but I can't talk about it. And I can't talk about why. Danny. Every problem is an opportunity in disguise. Except that wasn't Danny. That's what I have it listed here is, but okay. It was Reuben. Oh, they have it wrong on the... Yes, because he asks, you know who's on the $100 bill? And then I think one of them's like Michael Jackson. Another one was like or Alexander Hamilton. Okay. Yeah, it, it you have the, the quotation wrong for that one. So you, anyway, the only other one I had, Danny and Basher. Do I look 50 to you? Yeah. Really? Well, I mean, you know, only from the neck up. (laughs) He was 42 Uh, when they did that. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Do you have any others? Uh, Not really. It was a low, low list. Yeah. All right, let's move to the Stanley rubric then. Legacy is up first. Do you want to go first or second? I'll go second this time. This isn't the same as the original, and I think this lost something from it for the most part, the cast and the industry as well as the audience. I think the audience wanted it to be the same, and it just wasn't. At least it wasn't a flop enough that they still did the, in my opinion, far superior 13, but I really only can give it about a two for the industry because it's part of a larger franchise enough that it kind of carried things forward and allowed them to make another movie. And I mean, it didn't really hurt anybody's careers or do anything. I mean, this is still a watchable film. I wouldn't say it's one of the best, but it's there. And I don't know if the audience loves this as much as the original, but I don't think people necessarily think there's a huge difference between 12 and 13, the way that you and I think 13 is far superior. So I went with a two for them as well, four overall for Legacy. What'd you have down? Uh, I went with a 2.5 for uh, industry simply because it got greenlighted for a a third film. And uh, it is semi-popular. I mean, it does appear quite often in in, uh, streaming services and such. Where I really gave it points down is I went with 1.5 for the public because I've talked about, and and I'll go around and, Obviously, my circle of friends and acquaintances are limited to you a lot say. of people my, to myself or that are similar to myself. But the number of people who said, oh, why are you even bothering? I mean, 11 was great. 12? Eh. Well, maybe you could do 13, but 12? Eh. And so I went with 1.5. So you ended up at the same four I did. So that's an Correct. average of four between us. All right, impact significance. 
10th highest grossing movie of 2004, but it finished below Spider-Man 2, Shrek 2, which happened to be the number one worldwide box office movie of that year, Meet the Fockers, The Passion, and my personal favorite, Shark Tale. It finished below Shark Tale. But above National Treasure... What the hell is the, Shark Tale? It was a Will Smith joint where he was like this uh, fish who was trying to work on a car wash. It was an animated movie. I don't know. It was <laughs> Will Smith doing a voiceover for a fish. Okay. It's 2004, man. We actually saw that in theaters. I don't. I did not see that. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, yes, you did. No, I did not. Okay, you I did. Mom may have matter. taken you. Mom took us. You were there. It was a whole family thing. Anyway, I don't matter. ever remember. A, a That's different fish than it not wash. happening. That's different than it not actually happening. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This did, however, finish above National Treasure, the first one, and the Born Supremacy and Collateral. So, I mean, it's kind of got a weird zone where it's not like one of the biggest sequels in the world, but it's really not one of the worst. The funny part for me was this finished like 24th domestically, but it was really high on the worldwide gross or international grossing market. And I think a lot of that has to do with them featuring parts of Europe. So it ended up kind of working itself out in the end. As a result of that, I kind of raised it slightly for three and a half for the audience because it kind of made ventures out into the other parts of the world as opposed to just being a American movie, more or less. So if you can make stuff work even internationally, I think that's where a lot of movies right now are trying to make their growth is into the international markets more than domestic that's uh, what everybody's playing for, so they were ahead of the curve on that. But it was at least successful enough, again, to greenlight another sequel, and certainly didn't hurt the careers of anybody, so I went with a three for the industry, because the sequel was only a couple of years later, and you kind of buoyed the franchise. It was a good, not great movie, so I ended at a 6.5. Okay, I think it did well uh, at the box office, not fantastic, so on a scale of uh, zero or one to five as far as uh, the public. I went with a 2.5 for that simply because, again, the number of people uh, who saw it and then said, eh, which is what turned me off of even going and seeing it. And then as far as the industry itself, the reviews were rather shaky. I mean, the reviews were either, yeah, it's fun to go and see and it's kind of lighthearted versus, boy, these guys just mailed it in this time. So I went with a 2.5 for that for a 5 total. So that'll be a 5.75 average between us. Novelty. For me, this is a 4. It's a sequel. It's a cat burglar film in Europe, and it was based off of another script that was just re-engineered for an Oceans franchise and kind of feels like it now that I kind of look at it that way or through that lens. None of this seems to have the flair of the original or the coolness or the fun outside of that you can still see that the cast really enjoys one another and getting along and getting to make these movies, but it's not like it has the same style almost at times. There are a couple of scenes where it makes sense, but it just seems different, and there's something off about it. So I can't even say that it is the same quality of what we discussed as novelty last week with Ocean's Eleven. There's nothing to say that this is exceptional or unique within its own franchise, if for anything other than being kind of off from the other two. So it's a four for me. I went higher. I actually went as high as a seven for novelty, simply because... I, I thought about it, and the pacing and the way it was structured and such, I thought was unique. It didn't always work, but I, I could not put myself into a position where I thought of too many other films that kind of followed the same formula, per se. I mean, and I was trying to think, like, To Catch a Thief with uh, the Hitchcock film with Cary Grant and Grace Kelly, but uh, and I, I couldn't really think of too much. The original Pink Panther with David Niven and Peter Sellers. Oh, that's a good call. You know, that was probably as close as any. The so, Italian job. Yeah, I guess. When was that? Uh, late 90s? Well, that was the remake. The original one with 
Michael Caine was like from the late sixties, I think. Okay. So I thought it was fairly novel. It wasn't completely novel. It is a sequel. There had been things that had been, been done before. There were certain elements that were kind of stale at point, at some point in time. So that's why I went with a seven. Another one would be maybe the Thomas Crown Affair, another movie that was original with Steve McQueen and then got a remake. It was Steve yeah. McQueen in the original, wasn't it right? It was. And then yeah, the okay. remake was with... Um, with Pierce Brosnan. Pierce and- Brosnan. Oh, why am I drawing a blank? The same woman uh, from... Uh, Renee... Germany, um, Russo. Russo. All right. So that's a 5.5 average between us for novelty. Classicness, your category. I was kind of pleased by the fact that the females had a much more larger role in this film. I mean, I think Catherine Zeta-Jones was as uh, big a part of this film as any of the actors. And um, Julia Roberts had an expanded role from where she was in Ocean's Eleven of being a trophy as opposed to an actual character. So I went with a little higher. Uh, I went with a 7.5 on classicness. I couldn't think of anything that was too cringeworthy. Well, as you know, I always start with a 7, and I either work up or down from there. And I really didn't find reasons to mark points up. I think that if you're going to say anything, yeah, I can kind of agree that Catherine Zeta-Jones is Isabel is a much stronger character because they give her a lot more to do. She's part of the revolving action and one of the potential foils of everything that's going on. And yet it still suffers from the same eventual fate that you could maybe give a strike against for Ocean's Eleven. It's the man knows more and he's always going to be in charge of everything that he's kind of puppet mastering everything. Because realistically you think about the first film and Tess Danny, you better know what you're doing. And then by the end of it, you always knew what you were doing. I just didn't. And the admission of that. Now, that doesn't bother me. I could see where that does against people that find sexism in just about anything. And that's not necessarily a a knock against it. I just am trying to point that out. But in this same movie, we basically have the same thing where Isabel gets herself into trouble and Rusty is there because he had this cunning plan all along to reintroduce her to her father. And that gets her out of everything and she comes back to him. And so you could maybe say it's a damsel thing, even though it's a stronger character, but I'm not going to knock it for that. I just think it's something that we can probably focus on. If you want to say that, and we talk a lot about inclusion and diversity the two biggest character ads to this movie are Isabel, the Europol cop, and to lure a French noble cat burglar. So we at least had some international flair going on in here, even though Catherine Zeta-Jones is technically American. But we're trying to make some inroads. I just wouldn't say they were necessarily extra inclusive. It wasn't like you were dealing with, I don't know, some Asian businessman in Hong Kong and you were stealing from him. That might have seemed a little bit different. Even though, again, making the villain be an international bad guy from either like China or Russia really wouldn't have been too novel at that time. So I would I would also point to the fact that Sherry Jones ultimately, as Linus's mother, kind of almost saves uh, the day um, with her con uh, getting in, getting them out from capture. I suppose. And I guess this is a wider, broader cast. You have Eddie Izzard in there, at least for a small cameo. He makes a much larger appearance in the third film. But okay, I I still, I'm not going to mark any points up nor down from anything I've mentioned so far. Where I'm going to start taking a little bit of points off. There are some obviously dated references in this movie, like Julia Roberts being pregnant in 2004, because she actually was. The Sixth Sense being one of the biggest movies of the last 10 years at the time, so that those conversations still make sense. How many people really can honestly say that they know a almost 25-year-old movie and the plot of it with the reveal and how big a story that was now? I, I just don't know if a new audience is introduced to this movie. Have they really seen that movie? It just seems a little dated for me that they were kind of on the nose. And there's also one other part of the movie when they're trying to talk about how they're going to pay back Benedict if they get certain small pockets of money. That it'll take them, I think it was like 26 months or something like that, and they edited it up and it was supposed to be like fall 2005. 
And that really dates the film too. And I, I hate them putting in very specific numbers sometimes. It just kind of takes me out of the film. I only gave off kind of like a half point for that. The other things that take me out of the movie, the Julia playing test part, I just cannot get over it. It's so awkward for me. I know it's supposed to be funny and some people just love that scene and they point to it, but that just, I don't know. Combined with one other thing, the use of the Arsenal Football Club. I know this is being petty and personal, but any oh movie that gosh. uses Arsenal in it, I'm going to give you a half point off. So I got down to a 5.5. Go Gunners! Fuck you. <laughs> Do you need help with the math? No, it's a 6.5 between us. Okay. Rate watchability. I went with a 6. There's always something missing from this movie for me. And while it is entertaining and there are parts that are definitely rewatchable, I mean, when the Matt Suey scene came up for you, I was almost giddy because I loved that scene. But just overall, this movie just doesn't seem to work for me. And it never has. Between the weird meta scene or the fact that the second half of the movie is kind of meaningless, it's just never going to be on the same level as the other two movies for me. And I can kind of skip over, for the most part, this movie. I don't really have to see it. I can enjoy the other two without this entry really being there. I'll occasionally watch it in order to like have a marathon or whatever, but I can individually watch the other two movies without any problem whatsoever at all. So it's a six for me. It's actually risen for me. If we had done this a couple of years ago, it would probably been about a three or four. I'm going to give it a seven. I mean, if it's on and I, you know, just want to relax I'll throw this on and watch the film. I'm, you know, if it's on versus 11 or 13, uh, obviously I'm going to pick 11 or 13. So I, I won't, I won't with a seven. All right. So that is a 6.5 average between the two of us. So for audience score, we had an 85% for Google users. We only had a 60% for Rotten Tomato users, ending at a 7.25 overall for the film. So to recap, that was a 4 for Legacy. That was a 5.75 for Impact Significance. That was a 5.5 for Novelty. That was a 6.5 for Classicness. That was a 6.5 for Rewatchability. And that was a 7.25 for Audience Score, giving us a total of 35.5, putting it in between A Bridge Too Far and Friday. Okay. For currently 97th on the list. Okay, remaining questions. Uh. So I really only have one. I, and I don't know if it's ever completely explained to my satisfaction. I've always bandied this about. But does Tallur pay the entire $198 million or just the remaining 97 that they need to make up? Uh. Well... Good question. I don't know. I would say probably the entire, because he was banking on the fact that he was so sure he was going to win. See, I would probably guess the same thing, but I, I'm just never quite sure. So that's why it's kind of an open-ended question for me. Did you have any remaining questions? Not really. Yeah, I don't really either. Either stuff is answered by 13 or it's not, and it doesn't really matter. So I don't. I don't think there's too many other major plot holes to this one, but I'm not really interested in any of the outside story or how it finishes or anything else. They kind of make mention to both Catherine Zeta-Jones and Julia Roberts not being in the third one and just kind of pass it off like it's not their fight. But other than that, you know, we just kind of move on with the franchise and it's never really been about the females anyway. It's always been about the camaraderie between the guys. Correct. Final thoughts for the week. I don't really have any final thoughts. Uh, You know, we have the Oscars coming up. Yes, that program will be in two weeks. For us, I think it's Sunday the 25th. Yeah. Are you, have you locked in your, uh, your uh, punishment? Excuse me, March the 27th, Sunday the 27th. I have a lot of good suggestions. I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with Biodome and keep the others in reserve. Um, I came up with one that I think uh, is pretty gut-wrenching um, that you will really despise. But I'm going to keep that to myself just for a little bit as I continue to contemplate. See, I already know what the worst possible films for me would be. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I just don't know if you know what those would be. Yeah, well, okay. 
I can about imagine, but I, I, I do, and uh, I do know what I would like to do, but I'm, I'm going to have to make sure it's available to be scre- uh, streamed. Okay. Queen Kelly. No idea what that is. The 1929 uh, film directed by Eric von Stronheim and uh, starring Gloria Swanson. It is uh, was a box office disaster. It was uh, produced by Joseph P. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father. Stronheim uh, originally shot a film, and the film was uh, uh, nine hours. Uh, you uh, had to watch it over two nights in the theaters. Uh, Kennedy made him cut it, and it's just under five hours. So, yeah, it's... Only available on DVD or VHS tape. Yeah, if necessary, and I want to go that route, I, I might just buy the damn DVD so that um, you have to spend the five hours watching a silent film that <clears throat> most people deadpan as being incredibly boring. That's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah, the place on Amazon that I'm seeing right now would ship from Rasputin Music and Movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the okay. way, the DVD version is only an hour and 41 minutes long. Oh, they must have really done another cut somewhere. Because I studied that. When we did Sunset Boulevard, I looked at that film, and I, I spent some time studying for different things because Von, Von Strongheim directed it, and, and it was such... It, it ended up being the split between Kennedy and... and uh, Swanson, because uh, she was his mistress throughout most of the 20s. You know, she was so pissed at him for, for this film that almost destroyed her career that uh, uh, I thought it was interesting, to say the least. Well, as far as Oscar predictions go, uh, we did have a couple of shakeups with the SAG Awards, but because the BAFTAs are basically incongruent with the Oscars, those aren't necessarily predictive, and we're doing our show before both the Directors Guild and the Producers Guild will present their awards. So we don't have the, the benefit of that. But there is a dark horse entering the Best Picture race now. It has been a one-horse race for a while where we thought it was a clear front runner that was going to win, but there seems to be somebody sneaking up from behind that won the Hollywood Critics Awards and uh, also won Best Ensemble for the Oscar or for SAG as well. Excuse me. I recorded SAG and I haven't had a chance to watch it, but um, are you going to indicate which film that is? It's the one that you and I both have as the number one. If uh, we were voting. I see. So I all of a sudden have some renewed interest. If that ends up winning, I will be very, very happy. Okay. So remember, though, with the Oscars, there are a few categories that I will pick, but that you and I are not using as part of the competition. Uh, I'm starting to put together my notes for all of that. I think there are 18 total categories that you and I are picking for, and we have a tiebreaker on the in memoriam as we're still setting that up. And then at the end, they don't give a rankings of best picture, but we are going to give you our rankings of the best picture movies that were nominated. So 10 through 1. Yes. So you've got to play some catch-up. You've got a few to go. I am waiting on a few movies till you're going to be here next week, including Drive My Car, which is the last of the Best Picture nominees I have to see. Otherwise, I think I only have about four that I feel I really need to watch. But uh, for the most part, all of the betting and such takes place on other betting markets or predictor sites, and so I follow most of that pretty carefully as it is. Otherwise, we will get to that here in a couple of weeks, and uh, we'll see you then for that. We will be back at you next week with Oceans 13, and uh, yeah, I think that's it for the week. I've got uh, my weekend planned. Your mother's uh, away for a girl's weekend, so I'm going to have a frozen pizza and hold up in the uh, TV room uh, and watch uh, two of the uh, missing Best Pictures and uh, best well, the one Best Actor picture I'm missing. And a whole boatload of animated and shorts and documentaries for uh, basically a three-day weekend. 
So let's hear Dune, Nightmare Alley, then Tragedy of Macbeth. I got all those right? Correct. Summer of Soul. Correct. And you've watched the other one. Oh, I guess you would have to watch Flea yet. Are you planning to watch the animated uh, movies yet? Yes. Okay. I think other than Flea, and you have already actually watched The Mitchells and The Machines. We watched that last year, I think, over like Memorial Day weekend when we were all together. I actually had you guys sit and watch that one. The rest of those are all on Disney+. Plus, so I might skim it again since it's been a while since I've seen it. Okay. Well, I think all of those are pretty much a, an hour and a half or less. Either way, uh, we've got some stuff coming up. And uh, after our Oscars preview, then did we still want to do Major League for now the first two series that are canceled in baseball? Or do we want to switch <laughs> up the order for Sports Movie Month? I don't know. We'll have to see. Let's give it some time here next week or let's, two and see where things are. Let's Major League back and see if that coincides with when we can actually start baseball. I don't know if we want to discuss baseball when it's kind of going through what it is right now. So which of the other three that we had, Slapshot, The Water Boy, or uh, I'm trying to think, oh, Hoosiers, would you like to start with? Well, Hoosiers, because that's going to be close to... Uh... Uh, or at least closer, just after uh, tournament season's over. I think it'll come out two days after the national championship. Maybe even the weekend before the Final Four. It's one or the other. So let's do Hoosiers. All right, sounds good. So otherwise, we will see you all soon. Thank you for listening. Where are you headed, cowboy? Nowhere special? Nowhere special. I always wanted to go there. Next week, we will be covering the final movie of the Oceans Trilogy, Oceans 13, directed by Steven Soderbergh, written by Brian Koppelman and David Levine, starring George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, Andy Garcia, and Al Pacino. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that you can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Find us on Instagram, Twitter, and now TikTok at the handle at Gmote Podcast, G-M-O-A-T Podcast, or download the show from gmotepodcast.captivate.fm. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM. <laughs>